I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Thomas Prescott. Thomas? Thanks, Steve. First, Tom, thank you. Uh, boy, it's great to be here today, and uh, I'm thrilled. I, a lot of IQ and energy and interest, and uh, whenever I get a chance to interact with whether kids are in grade school or junior high or high school, college, talking about science and entrepreneurship in the future, it reminds me why we work so hard, because at, at the point where you are, in, it's Darth Vader, don't, uh, you know... <laughs> I'm assimilating you. You're now corporate America. No. Uh, it reminds me that, uh, that everything is still possible, and that's the wonderful uh, plate you've got in front of you for the rest of your life. So it's, uh, it's really my honor to be here today. Uh, one quick survey while we're here. We have a range of students and faculty and others. How many of you ever had braces? Raise your hands. All right. Scientific survey, more than 50%. How many of you loved it? Someone loved it. Obviously... Uh, you know, why'd you love it? I felt like it was in the club once I, once I got it. You got in the club. You were official. You got your team colors on it. It was great until you went home and all, all you could eat is soup. Um, I, I will tell you, Align Technology, uh, we're here to do a couple things with you today and if, with your forbearance. Uh, my uh, agenda is just to organize to keep me on track, and you've got a lot of things to do. I'm going to give you a, bless you, I'm going to give you snapshots of a great Silicon Valley success story, a Stanford a success story uh, and an innovation and uh, entrepreneurship success story. I'm also going to give you a few observations. I'm, I'm not qualified uh, to teach leadership or to tell you the right way to do it. I'll just share with you a few observations, what I'll call a few tenets of, of leadership and management. And then finally, I want to share with you a little of my thinking about the, the headwinds in the medical device industry. I think a critical med, med tech and biotech, a very critical part of our of our future uh, for all humanity, as well as certainly one of the bulwarks of, of American entrepreneurship and uh, innovation that we've exported globally. So uh, with that, how many of you had heard about Invisalign before, the Clear Braces company? Um, this company was, you, you may know many things about it, and you probably think of it as a piece of plastic. But it's, it's many things, but mostly Align Technology is, uh, is an engineering marvel. And the little piece of plastic that represents the aligners. In fact, I should ask, anybody here a patient in treatment? Boy, not much market penetration, one person. You see the opportunity we have here. So uh, when the venture guys ask you how big your market is, there we are, we're uh, maybe 80 people, uh, one and a quarter percent penetration, we'll call it, for, our, for this slice of market. Um, but, but Align Technology uh, came into being as an impossible idea, like many of the things you play around with. I love the contest. Um, and uh, today, you're looking at an environment where everything's still possible, but many things are harder. So go back to what you think about what was going on in 1997 uh, at Stanford, at the Graduate Business School. What would be a couple differences in your minds, just jump out, different from today, from 1997? One thing. No, nope, no, nope, never mind. All right, but that doesn't count. Next. Somebody jump in. What's different today? One thing, yes. Social networking. Social networking. Think about, we didn't even think what that meant. It was maybe classmates.com or something like that, right? What else? What else was going on? Bubble I'm sorry, over there? The dot-com bubble hasn't happened yet. The dot-com bubble. Come back to that. Yes. iPhones and computers. iPhones and all this, iApps, everything. So I'm going to jump on this for a minute. The bubble was still a bubble. It hadn't popped. So before that bubble popped, what was going on, say, in the financing community? Was there more or less available funding than today? Way more. Way more. You got it. So think about two graduate students at Stanford, uh, and I take my hat off to them, uh, Zia Schisti and Kelsey Wirth, that had this idea, and they, yet they went up and down Sand Hill Road, not far from here, and everybody said, no, you're crazy. Two wild-eyed Stanford students with an idea that you could somehow get away from braces and brackets and wires. And uh, at Kleiner Perkins, here's an ad for them, said, you know, this is a crazy idea, but I'll give you a little bit of money if you can solve these, answer these three or four questions. And they did that, and they came back and got them connected with a few medical schools and orthodontic departments, and they answered a few more questions. And that ultimately led to a pretty fast-paced cycle of financing 
and uh, tackling big technological problems because no one, people could use pieces of plastic to move teeth or retain teeth, but no one had ever imagined how you might use technology to, to uh, make this more systematic using computers and 20 to 32 3D objects in the mouth with no reference frame, and then the, the manufacturing technology to enable this, and so on five or six or seven fronts, it was basically impossible, and there were no technologies out there in the world that anybody could find that could actually do that, even if you repurposed best-in-class technology. So, so this became quickly a, a financing and race to solve technology problem so you could actually develop a product and bring it to market. Um, at the core of line technology is technology and innovation, and while you may think of us as a consumer company today, We've certainly pioneered in, in the dental industry uh, the ability for a smaller company to create brand awareness and mobilize consumers and ask for a product by name, which is a new dynamic. But the bigger innovation in the company was uh, underscoring the technology. Uh, they innovated, we innovated, and much of this was done before I came in early of 2002. Uh, but they innovated new processes and technology to personalize each treatment, each patient treatment, with uh, a class two medical device. And those of you that hang around the medical school or biomedical engineering understand that's not trivial. Uh, certainly today it wasn't back then. Uh, we've become the global leader in mass customization. And imagine how personal this is. It fits in you and if it doesn't fit perfectly and doesn't do the job, you're gonna take it out. Again, the only way compliance happens is if you wanna wear it and you see progress. And every one of these aligners, every one of these treatments has to fit you perfectly or it doesn't work. Um, we make over 40,000, we don't make any standard parts. Every part we make in a demand flow manufacturing system is completely unique with no standards. You know, kind of microns of, of, uh, of fit and conformance, and yet everyone is unique because everybody's mouth is different. Everybody's anatomy, physiology, and treatment is different. And we have to accommodate how the orthodontist or dentist wants to pursue that treatment within some clinical standards. So the company basically did this. We've made now over 60 million completely unique, and this is not an advertisement, but I'm, I'm highly proud of our team that's done this. And since you're talking about entrepreneurship and innovation, and we're sitting here in one of the best engineering schools in the country, you guys can appreciate what that meant and what it took. 60 million completely unique class two medical devices, and now over a million three patients in treatment are finished. And we continue to have 90% plus a very or extremely satisfied marks from the patient. So we're just getting started. You saw a minute ago our really small share, at least this slice. Um, and again, you come across, you see how amazing the technology we've created to do it. And so at the core of it is intellectual property and novel innovation. But you're looking now at something that looks very easy. I'd like to take you back a little bit. And we're going to come back and talk about this, I guess. And, and uh, and before I do that, I'd like to maybe, uh, and I'm on video, I realize there's a risk of this as being preserved for all, but I need to do full disclosure. Two things, when I looked at the flyer, that's an older, an older photo, I clearly, there's truth in advertising in here, that's probably a four or five year old video, more gray hair, et cetera. The second thing is, I'm a failed entrepreneur. The only company I ever started up failed. And remember, they always fire the sales and marketing guy first, that was me. So. Uh, we did a company back in 1985-86 uh, for early optical disk storage and applications on a factory floor. I had come out of factory automation, and uh, it was a great idea until we had one customer doing a pilot project. They were called GM, and if you ever do your history, that was the end of Roger Smith. So GM got a cold, all their suppliers got pneumonia or died. Thank and you. Are you? Yes, the answer is yes, we died. Um, <laughs> We, uh, we didn't go, so as, as I look out at potential entrepreneurs and tip my hat to entrepreneurs, many of them failed in many things. And so I don't know whether you read Thomas Edison or somebody else, whether it's experiments or anything else, there's more failure than there is success, but failure is an outcome and you learn a lot from it. So with that kind of full disclosure about me personally, I've had the pleasure of coming in and working with, coming in behind, um, and working alongside multiple founders and have, in most every case, have had uh, enduring great relationships with founders. And uh, Steve and I were talking briefly, and what's the difference between an operating hack like me and uh, a true entrepreneur? And the answer is uh, a few things. One, it's life experience and skills. Uh, and, and then two, it's um, 
I, I would probably, I might pursue a big bet as an operating type, and I would have plans and, and a, rational, a rationale for doing that. But I'm not as likely to go after a wild, crazy idea that's totally disruptive. And, and so once somebody does that, maybe they can't scale that business or it's, it's not growing fast enough or there's some other problems. And, and somebody like me can be a good complement to that. Um, it's not often that a great entrepreneur can be a great operating person. There are exceptions. And, uh, but I have the greatest admiration for, uh, for the true entrepreneurs that have figured out a way to create something truly disruptive. The challenge is how many of those companies that create this new thing, this new segment, whether it's in social media, how many of the early movers there really got to, to game that? Facebook certainly won. But in looking at any new space where somebody has come out with a disruptive new idea or new technology, how many of those early movers really get a chance to, to capture most of the profit from that new space? So how many have iPhones or, uh, or let's call it a, a fancy MP3? How many had MP3 players before you had your iPhone or, or iTunes or anything like that? What happened to all those guys? So see, Apple thought of something completely better, bigger, more complete. We never knew we needed that until they did. We never knew we needed the iPhone and all the apps ecosystem before we did that. But the original players in many spaces don't get to capture all of the profit. And so young companies that go through startups have great opportunities to go not only innovate, but then you've got a race uh, to try and uh, continue that innovation cycle and start to scale your business so you have a chance of actually uh, creating business success. So Align Technology, I'm going to step you through a couple of stages. I'll say the startup through real growing pains. And uh, early in 97, uh, Zia and Kelsey were at Stanford uh, Business School getting their masters, their, their MBAs, and they thought there had to be a better way. They came up with this idea. They actually got a little bit of seed money. The company was formed in April of, uh, of 1997. It was followed by an A round, a pretty good size A round of financing in the summer. And uh, they went ripping off on uh, solving problems, imagining technologies, and starting to think about how they could actually bring a product like this to market. Uh, the product actually came to market, in, and its first product was shipped in August of 99. Um, there was a lot that happened between then, including several financings. All in, before we made a profit, the company raised $280 million. Now, do you think that's, do you think that's likely today? And so I, I think, you know, there's shaking no way. There's much more pressure on companies with very big ideas that require a lot of capital to enable them. And so virtual models, you've had some great speakers in here talking about virtual models and different ways to do this. Very few companies are going to have the capability to raise those kinds of dollars. And I don't know that you could have done what these guys did in today's environment with the access to capital that was back then versus what it is today. But that said, they did a fabulous job of that. They had a first-class uh, group of folks here, many from Stanford, computational labs, uh, some of the same you know, DNA that, that went into some of these great companies in the Valley. And they were solving uh, enormously difficult uh, 3D geometry problems and manufacturing technology problems. And with all the kind of dog years of work that you can imagine went into that. Um, I'll, I'll take this out to 2002 when I came in company was shipping product, but we were not uh, what I'll call successful. Operationally, we were not capable. The right case wasn't going to the right uh, office. The product didn't always fit perfectly. Our customer service wasn't very good. And we had a new dynamic emerge. Um, uh, to scale, finding scarce computer kind of 3D CAD CAM skills, Azia, who had deep Pakistani roots, had gone to Pakistan and set up an operation there where we could scale in a cost-effective way. Um, and then what happened in September of 2001, 9-11? It became very difficult for us to continue to scale that facility, bring Westerners over there, drive process improvement and everything else. Uh, the company was struggling to continue to grow and scale, running out of money. And what happens when that goes on in startup companies? What do the board start saying? What do we do? Should we think about a new CEO with more experience and everything else? I wasn't there for those discussions, uh, and I was really uh, coming out of uh, what I'll say more clinically intense med tech, interventional cardiology, respiratory, 
patient safety monitoring. I, I loved healthcare and I, and I loved the mission directed nature that healthcare businesses and med tech businesses had. But, and I thought, you want to go see this dental company? I thought, dentistry? You know, gosh, it didn't seem like it was clinically intense. When I came down to a line, I saw amazing people, great technology, and a wonderful opportunity, but some significant problems. I came aboard in March. Uh, we looked at the whole business, decided we had to be more focused with our choices and what we were doing. Um, we cut our burn rate. We raised a little bit of money, and we actually turned cash flow positive in 2003. Uh, along the way, we made the decision that we had to exit Pakistan. We moved some of that operation to Costa Rica. Uh, Zia ultimately left the board, and uh, and we've had we had a we basically started doing fewer uh, things that pissed off customers. You know, it's a it's a long list of things that that when you're not operating well, you can go right down that list and fix those. So uh, what's the old story? When you're in a hole, don't keep digging. So step out of the hole. We basically just started uh, running the business more sensibly and taking care of the basic stuff. Um, so that was kind of the, the startup, the, the scramble, the financing, and the first commercialization and growth of the company. By the end of 2004, we were about 140, 150 million in revenue and growing nicely again, 30, 40% a year. And uh, what happens when, when everything starts going well in a company? Everybody gets sick, yeah. No, what happens when everything goes, when everything's going well? What about in your personal life? Everything's going perfect. You assume it's going to be great forever, right? So maybe you relax. And companies are like any organization. They, when people don't keep pressing into something, keeping your eyes on the horizon for the bigger thing, you start to relax. And guess what? You got an inflection point. And, and you start getting less focused. Your execution isn't as good. And the time you should press the most is when you're doing the best, right? That's when you can press advantage, whether it's technology, market, your organization. Um, and so we, we ran into a few execution challenges, and then lo and behold, one of our founders showed up again. Uh, I'll just say we have a rich history, and we wound up in lots of litigation for a couple years. And, uh, and you know, what doesn't, Nietzsche was right, what doesn't destroy you or kill you makes you stronger. Ultimately, adversity is a good thing in nature, in the marketplace, uh, in competition for innovation. And we went through a couple cycles, but through that process, uh, we went through some very challenging times. And I've included this bringing out through 2008 because we all know what happened in, uh, in the meltdown. Just when we were getting our act back together, we, after uh, competitive threats were mostly dissipated, uh, the, whole, the whole world went crazy and consumers went into a shell and our customers were freaked out. And uh, we were all collectively saying, what happens next? So what happens when, uh, when everything else goes wrong? You step back and take a very uh, sober look at your prospects and your opportunities. And we did that. And we put a turnaround plan together, took some cost of the business, got refocused. And uh, through that period, we've really been scaling the business and came through the downturn, actually grew. We took $20, $25 million of cost out of the business made some hard choices to focus on fewer priorities, and uh, have exited that cycle doing pretty well. I'd say right now it's a pretty choppy economy, and, and uh, you work through the time you're in. But uh, the, the phase we're in right now is basically scaling to make sure we stay, that we created this new space. Uh, we innovated and pioneered clear orthodontics. Uh, our goal now is to be the leader, and we really only have about 3% share of the existing starts just in North America alone. Those starts with orthodontists. So we got very small share. We got an opportunity to, to switch over the whole world to clear aligners who would want braces. Um, we'll help you feel like you're in the club, give you something else. But uh, at every stage of a company, there are very different challenges. And uh, you can learn much from what we've been through, hopefully uh, uh, vicariously, so you don't have to repeat it. I'll, I'll stop there. I've given you kind of a speed review of our history, and I'm happy to take questions in real time here. I have a few other ideas I'll throw on the table, but um, what questions do you guys have about stages? Yes? Let me, uh, let sure, me take sure. some questions from the uh, 178 class. I asked a couple, and uh, I'll, I'll keep them instead of uh, the typical three we normally ask since uh, MSND 178 is wrapped around this class, and you've been uh, kind right. enough to volunteer to uh, come into it. I won't use up our magic three. I'll just use one. And I, I think the most interesting uh, questions kind of boil down to um, 
what is the interface between the, the founder and the new operating guy who comes in? Are there expectations that are kind of unsaid or not said, or what do you wish would happen to make that better? Or, I mean, implicitly, that's a loaded sure. question on purpose. Uh, Thanks. Jeez. <laughs> um, and open uh, it up to the class. Sure. I, I would say, again, I've... I've um, with the exception of one founder, I've, I've got great relationships with many founders. I've worked alongside three or four. Um, what I'd say, first of all, is you need a mature relationship, and you need to recognize there's different life experiences, skills, orientation, and if you can do it right, they ought to complement and not compete. Now, that requires uh, emotional maturity on the operating person that says, oh, everything here was bad, I need to fix it, versus saying, boy, this is amazing, I can see a lot of ways it can be better. Are there sacred cows? Are there some other things that, that are very important to you as founder? Oftentimes, founders remain on the board, and that still maintains a, an important relationship. On the case of the founder, many founders, it's, it's your child. You can't imagine seeing it other than how you see it. So it requires some emotional maturity from the founder to, uh, to develop that working relationship with the operator. In the best case, uh, you have a, a, a board that is having open dialogue about this. You have a founder that really cares most about the company being successful, and you have an operator that, that is able to leverage their skills but, but is respectful and appreciative of the fact they, they wouldn't have given birth to this wonderful thing called this new company, creating jobs and opportunities for a lot of other people. So I, I, it, there's a lot of, uh, I, one of the presentations, and I know a few of the individuals that have characterized this as Shakespeare and Hamlet and others, and, there's plenty of drama in Silicon Valley about uh, startups and founders being moved out and all that stuff. I would, I would assert that it doesn't have to be that difficult. And uh, if you're thinking about starting up a company, think about what it evolves and imagine, imagine success. I, I do that personally. I visualize the outcome I want, whether it's three years, five years. And, and then I imagine where my skills won't fit anymore. And I personally don't want to run a $5 billion company. I, it's, it's too far away from customers and employees and the magic of innovation for me to, to get really excited about that. So for me to think about this business, if I'm here five more years and we're billions in revenue, it's less interesting for me and I wouldn't be as passionate. So I have to start thinking about, you know, either that or the board does it for me. Wh when would be the right time for me to be thinking about somebody else that loves running a, a $2 billion company taking it to five? Because the work you do is different. I think it's the same thing for each of you that are starting companies. And if they're virtual, it may be different. It, you may not have a successor, uh, an operator. You may be able to rely on the ecosystem around you and some of the other people that in virtual space can complement you know, what your skills and experiences are. But, but I, just, I believe life, life is too short, and, uh, and you ought to have open, honest discussions. And if, if the operator is coming into a situation where the founder doesn't agree and the board doesn't agree, then I'd say that's not a situation the operating type would you'd say, I'm not sure this is the right thing for me. I personally don't like to drop into uh, situations like that. Let's open it up to the class. Sure. Any other questions? Yes. I'm interested in knowing how the market penetration process was because uh, you weren't competing with some other businesses um, and the new product was a new type. So. How easy or hard was it to, you know, convince the doctors to employ this, and uh, and then what what kind of resources was necessary to do that? Sure, I'm going to try very hard to play back the question, okay. uh, and if I don't get it right, you're going to help me. I think there was a three part here. The first is interested in uh, market penetration. How hard was it to uh, to get doctors to uh, believe in and start to adopt? And then three, what kind of resources went into that? Was that pretty close? Yeah. All right, uh, it's hard. Uh, if if uh, the medical device industry, whether it's a dentist or a doctor in, in a specialty, they, they're looking for proof, uh, clinical evidence, uh, white papers, clinical studies in some cases. And in the early days, Align didn't have that. One of the reasons they went out quickly to consumers was to say, boy, who would really want braces? And they had a great value proposition, but the problem was, especially orthodontists, had, it was almost dogmatic. Everything they did was brackets and wires. So uh, the job they had to do was uh, explain them, give them the, the clinical reasons, the economic reasons, and all the other reasons why they would say, you should trust us with part of your practice to at least start trying this. And the company wasn't really set up to do that. They didn't have a lot of people in the early days that understood uh, clinical development and, and uh, innovation inside med tech and why doctors make choices. Um, 
So, so they went to the consumer, and it was exciting for a young private company to run a $30 million ad campaign. Uh, there was a lot of buzz, but very little of that translated into case starts for a line. It turned into a lot of case starts for the brackets manufacturers. Uh, they should have at least sent us Christmas cards. But uh, um, so the company basically had to, we had to retrench a bit, provide the reasons to believe, uh, clinical evidence, uh, and a lot of science, and we're still doing that. The, the consumer has far greater demand for this product than the channel, our, our GP dentists and orthodontists, who would still probably rather default uh, with some, uh, with a little bit of, uh, there's a, a group of committed champions here, maybe a third of the orthodontists out there, but many of them are more comfortable using traditional approaches. So you've got to invest in clinical studies, uh, uh, trade shows, a lot of clinical education. We have an award-winning website where we have a lot of CE content. Uh, and uh, bring them along, give them a reason to change. The other thing that happens in dentistry is, uh, how many of you are in biomedical or med tech or other areas in engineering? What's one thing, say, uh, cardiac surgery or interventional cardiology versus dentistry? What would be one big difference? Payer. The payer. The payer, yes. Private pay, that's a big difference. How about morbidity mortality? Anybody hear of somebody dying from a dental procedure? <laughs> if, it, if it happens, you probably got very bad care. But um, the, the very low morbidity mortality in dentistry and orthodontic specialty uh, and the very fragmented nature uh, and private pay means uh, they're slower to change. If, uh, if, a, if a big change occurs in interventional cardiology, let's use stents, uh, changes within a quarter or two, you would see most people using what's now considered standard of care based on very clear clinical evidence. It, it would almost be irresponsible to stay with old technology if it was proven that there's greater morbidity and mortality. Now, we may test that when the government's the payer and say, we don't care so much about that. But uh, and so back to your original reason, this is why it's taken a longer time. We're still working on it. Um, the company spends a lot of money on clinical research, on sales and marketing, and all those things. And I'd say we're still, we're still in the first or second inning of that adoption. And market share is still very small. Sure. Other questions? Yes? What's it like running a company that has a very physical product in a place like Silicon Valley where there's computer startups going at 10,000 miles an hour everywhere and you guys have to like physically go out and meet the people that you're going to be working with? Sure. The question is, what's it like? Uh, we're living in line of Silicon Valley where things move at, uh, at breakneck pace and, and it's electronic world and you can reach customers, uh, you know, uh, in a virtual space, in a parallel universe, without and a real economy, uh, without ever seeing them, and yet we've got a real physical product we have to deliver on it. Um, for me, uh, it's a great thing personally, because again, I'm I am uh, passionate about medical devices and healthcare, and seeing uh, having a purpose kind of based company, very mission focused, where we can we can do well, and yet see how people are so excited. We don't save lives in this part of our med tech. But we really change lives, and uh, a beautiful smile for somebody that never could smile or feel good about themselves is, uh, is really a big deal. And I frankly underestimated that when I came here. I was used to life-saving technology. This is life-changing. So uh, for me, I would probably have a harder time in a virtual world because I, I get kind of renewed by that, uh, that, the, all the stories and, and seeing patients and doctors out there with people that we've touched. So, so for me, medical devices, healthcare is... Uh, is uh, is a passion more than it is a kind of a job. It pays pretty well too, but yeah. Yes. Do you have a Facebook fan page on your channel? We do. We do. Uh, if you're not a teen. I'd also point you to InvisalignTeen.com. That feels creepy, but uh, um, uh, but I, we do. We have uh, we have a lot of social. Back to the question about social networking. We're we're we have a very uh, viral kind of product. Pat, when when you have a very uh, uh, honest offering and, and it resonates with your consumer and the value proposition when you knock it out of the park all the time we've got some very passionate fans that love to talk and one of the things we see today with uh, with frankly your generation and those younger than you is you know your own self-produced content you don't rely on somebody else's content and you're telling your own story so we're trying to enable that with all the the digital uh, uh, social media environment and ecosystem and we're doing a pretty good job Yes. So, uh, how do you, how would you say the culture changed when you came into your company and now, like, what's the fundamental change in the culture and the people there? Sure. Um, 
So the question was, what has changed with the culture since I came in? Um, what I would say, what I would hope, and it's not just me, it's, it's, it's bringing in another team and bringing in people that commit to the core values. I would say the core values of this company haven't changed. The, the DNA of the founders will always be in a company. And, and I think that's a good thing, and, and you shouldn't dodge that. Um, uh, the, the, you see the base of technology we created, and, um, and that's a wonderful blessing. But, uh, but also the passion uh, for our customers and their patients is there as well, the, the being the right kind of place to work. Now, we don't, we don't quite have the campus of a Google or whatever, but our employees are there on weekends, and they're doing it because they believe in it, and they, they want to take it to the next level. And uh, I, think, I think now you layer on, do you have, when employees run out of gas, it's because you work really hard and you don't get things done. So now if you can add, you know, kind of basic stuff to, to consistently execute well, uh, that, that progress, that, that kind of winning kind of re-energizes the team. So I, I do think, though, uh, in any company you have a, a stated culture. You can find it on the wall or a card. And then you see the, the invisible culture. And a lot of times the, the things we don't like about where we are or where we work are that invisible side. And I think it's really important to be honest about that. Here's what we say, but here's what we really do. And a lot of times those norms are more powerful in a company. Gee, we like open discussion, yet you never have arguments, right? It always happens in the hallway or whatever. So I think when you guys are out, if you're talking to companies and getting jobs, are there any jobs available? Um, go figure out what the real culture is, otherwise what they say. There's always the, the intended culture and the unintentional culture that's out there in a the business. I, I hope we've made it a bit better, and it's, uh, and it's built on what they had. Other questions? Yes. Uh, how easy or difficult is it to obtain uh, an approval for, from the Food and Drug Administration in order to launch a new medical device into the market? Uh, I'm going to come to that in a minute. The, the question is, how difficult is it uh, working with the Food and Drug Administration and other bodies outside the U.S. to get approval to launch, commercialize a new medical device? It's really hard right now. And I, um, I, I, you guys have had Josh McHour in here not too long ago. He's been in a few times. He's a great entrepreneur and uh, serial founder. Uh, I just spent some time with him last weekend at a meeting. It is very hard right now. And what's more difficult is uh, it's moving. And so what happens when there's uncertainty, um, uh, when what appears to be political policy is both being played out through heightened regulatory action, and, it, and that, appears, that can appear to be arbitrary sometimes, and then when new rules are coming in and, and how they'll be implemented is not clear. That's all the way from CMS, where they're determining reimbursement and payment, all the way through FDA and clinical trials and all that. So for a founder, for a VC firm, and for the other actors in a young company, this is very destabilizing. And uh, most VCs I know have backed away from big idea opportunities because the capital isn't available for it and uh, the risks are too high right now. And that's a, that's, a, that's a huge problem. It's a huge problem. But I believe we're going to work through it. There needs to be certainty about what the process is, and then you can figure out what you can do with it. A couple other questions maybe on this? Yes, in the back. in the upcoming decades? Boy, um, uh, the question was, we're playing in dentistry right now in orthodontics. What do I think is going to be really prominent? Um, you know, there's, there's some obvious technology gaps. In the traditional way medical devices have come about is a, a, a clinician that's really smart is saying there's got to be a better way to do this. This is an unmet patient need. People are dying or they certainly aren't getting well or you have chronic diseases that just linger. Uh, and you have engineers that are thinking of the same thing, and they get together and figure out a way. Um, I think there is, so there's going to be convergence in the next 5, 10, 15 years of, I believe, today's medical device technology with a, an original clinical focus, patient problem, unmet need. And uh, my hope is that with uh, just as convergence has happened in some other areas of the technology world, multiple technologies getting together and shifting the curve, I think there's a great opportunity in medical devices. Uh, sitting here today, the obvious places where innovation is rewarded are for the big disease states, 
you know, interventional cardiology, uh, you know, and there's a whole class of problems from atrial fibrillation to still sudden cardiac death and things like that. There's a huge problems with, you know, what's called COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which is just, you know, a terrible way to waste weight, emphysema and all that. And, and we've got all the, uh, you know, 60% of the population is going to wind up with type 2 diabetes. So what I'd say there are enormous problems and enormous opportunities, but I, my hope is that the traditional strength of medical devices will continue and we will bring a whole new way to, to get them to be more cost effective uh, and be able to prove that the, the system can afford that intervention because it'll eliminate the need for, uh, but be able to prove that, eliminate the need for a long-term chronic disease state. I would say um, go figure out what, what the most expensive problems are. Diabetes is clearly going to be one of them. Um, uh, heart failure is going to be one of them. Uh, sudden cardiac death, and certainly cancers, cancers of all types have been around. We're still not smart enough about how to apply uh, even the best in class drugs today. And I think uh, there are a handful of really amazing companies in this valley working on very targeted therapeutics. You know, why should a one class, uh, the best class of, uh, of, of treatments for breast cancer only work on, you know, 20 percent of the women? And, and they endure all the side effects and yet they don't really work and six months later you know, you've got bigger problems. We should know what will work, what therapeutic regimen will work on individual patients. So I, I'm actually, it's a hard time, but I'm very optimistic about the long term if, if we don't kill the golden goose. I didn't answer your question, sorry. But there's lots of big problems out there. <laughs> sorry. Maybe one more question or not, and I'll move on. Yes? Uh, just kind of a follow-on to that. Uh, do you see this kind of innovation in the pharmaceutical industry? You know, uh, the question is, do I see ph innovation in the pharmaceutical industry? Uh, you know, I'm, I, when I moved into... Uh, medical technology out of factory automation, it was after I, I had a startup that failed and I was trying to think about, I was kind of answering her question for myself, what's going to be hot for the next 20, 30 years? I, I need to learn more about being a better leader and a manager and I, and I want to find a segment of the economy that doesn't go through the business cycles the same that I had seen uh, broad based industry. And I, back then we didn't exactly have Google, um, the internet wasn't around and so you'd go to the library and spend time microfish and SAP, you know, S&P reports and all that stuff. Um, what took weeks probably could do in 30 minutes today but the upshot was I looked at healthcare and medical technology and I decided not to go after pharma. It's a long way of me saying I don't think I'm qualified to answer what pharma, what I do see happening is they're moving over from classic pharma into biotech um, and they're moving into generics and they're finding ways to uh, find low cost environments where they can bring a, a therapeutic regimen. Uh, one of our board members is, uh, uh, was a number two guy at Amgen and, and uh, they work very hard but it's very expensive what they do for biologics and um, you know I don't know what's going on in pharma as well as others but there's great people you could bring in. I, I do believe that integrating pharmaceutical regimens is a big opportunity with informatics and uh, the genetic profile, how you can make certain therapeutics work for a certain class of patients and know they won't work for others because a lot of the therapeutics uh, don't have the effect we want. But uh, you can probably get somebody better than me to answer on the pharma question. Uh, way in the back, yes. How are FDA type regulations different in, in international markets? How are FDA type regulations different in international markets? Um, uh, five years ago, uh, the FDA had the most um, uh, organized process with the most straightforward milestones and what I'll call it stability and understanding. Um, and some of the more difficult, and the reason why more clinical trials and innovation, and that was really the case for about 15 years. And that's why most of the clinical trials and invention was going on here. And about five years ago, that started to change. And now most people go do clinical studies, uh, first in man trials, first in woman trials, sorry, uh, first in human trials, and, uh, and work like that. That's moving out to the European countries, Latin America, and others. Not because they're lower cost necessarily, but because there's a more straightforward process to move through to get the clinical understanding done. That informs how you come back to the FDA then with, with a pivotal trial design or something else although they won't accept, typically the FDA won't accept those, they need to be, needs to be uh, in the United States. Uh, so it's just flipped the reverse, that the USA used to be the gold standard and the place you'd start, and then with that in hand you could go out to the rest of the world. Now it's just the reverse. My fear is um, our regulators are trying to say to others, slow down, you're making us look bad. 
and uh, it, it really can uh, crush innovation. Safety is critical and important. That's a, you can't do without that, and, and if you're not doing it right, you, there need to be repercussions. But the, the innovators I know are passionate about uh, curing disease and improving patient life, and, uh, and it, it, it's, it's getting slower and tougher. But it's right now easier outside the U.S. than in. Shall I move on? Keeping track of time here. I'm going to, uh, so we've got a great market in here. I can give you all referrals for great orthodontists in the area if you're interest, interested. But, uh, but I, you know, it's fun for me to talk about this business. We could do this for three or four more hours. You have a lot more to do. So what I'd like to do is shift to um, this idea and then go into management and leadership ideas. Uh, we've been working very hard on evolving and scaling this business. Um, but, but we wouldn't have had the opportunity to do that if it wasn't for that crazy idea that most every venture capital type up and down Sand Hill Road said no to. Klein or Perkins wound up funding it. But, uh, but if they hadn't said, yes, we're willing to bet on this crazy idea, we, wouldn't have, we never would have had the opportunity to, to evolve and create this great story, and it would have been one more idea never acted on. So you're sitting here in the absolute cradle of entrepreneurship and innovation, I'd say go do something, go create that revolution in your own minds. Before you do that, though, um, think about how, even as you start, you can plan ahead to make sure that when you pioneer that space, when you create that opportunity, how are you going to figure out with your friends, your partners, your employees, to be able to capture the opportunity that means? Or are you going to be the first blip that somebody else owns the space on. So think not just about how you're going to create the revolution, but how you're going to build a real business and capture that profit. And one organizing principle today, and I'm a fan of Clayton Christensen, I, you know, you see it in reality today. He says, be patient for growth, don't be patient for profitability. That's a really interesting idea, and that's flipped on its head from what we talked about in 1997-98 when funding was available. Back then it was go for eyeballs, pour money on it, and run hard and get your, get your turf, like the great land rush back in the 1800s. Today, I think you have the opportunity to say, how do I create a real business? Is there a real business model here? Or is this just an idea that I have to pour cash into? So be, have the end in mind. Think about how you would scale this business and turn it into a real company. And sometimes it wouldn't be a real company. Maybe it's just an interesting product, all right? I'm going to shift gears, and I'm just going to put all these up here and talk through them, and we can... You can ask a few questions about it. And uh, I'll just call these, you know, hard-won experience. Every one of these that I, speak, that I speak about, I've usually violated. So if I just start with what I used to think about for strategic planning and the ideas, I used to think I'll come up with the brilliant idea or the strategy, and then I'll hire the right people to help me execute it. The answer is it's just the opposite. Everything starts with having the right people around the table having the right team. And along the way, that team has to evolve. The people you started with may not be the people you can go through the middle with and may not be the people you can scale with because they have different skills and temperament. They may have different things in mind. But at any point, ask yourself, are, are these the right people with me? Am I, and by the way, have I changed? Am I working at the right place if you're at somebody else's uh, company? But everything starts with the right team, whether it's a startup, whether it's an operating business or anything else. Um, you can tell I don't like this stuff at all, right? But, but, it, but I, don't, you know, I don't know how you go through life without being alive and feeling passion and having a purpose. And so part of this great thing about having a startup is it kind of weans itself out. It's got to fit itself into your life. It might disrupt your, your degree. Of course, your parents or whoever's paying for your college would really have some ideas about that. You're doing what? But the idea is if you're passionate about it and you can't sleep because you have to do it, and it's completely unreasonable, then it's going to sort itself out pretty quickly whether you're really serious about it or not. And whether that's how, you, how you, you bring your passion to bear or something else, I'm just telling you, life is short. If you're sleepwalking, fix it. Change it. If you're in a company you're not passionate about, get out of there. Find another job. Find a place you can make a difference. Have some fun. Work with people you believe in. And it's look, it's not perfect. You're always going to have bosses or people that work for you or coworkers that are jerks, and you can always find reasons to you know, feel like a victim. But I'm telling you right now, if, if you're not feeling alive, even when you've got a lot of work to do at Stanford and a great engineering school and you've got homework to do tonight in labs, 
I'm just telling you, change it. And it, it life is all about passion. Um, when it comes to turning that personal passion into a company, you have to have a vision and you have to have this compelling idea about what you're going to accomplish and how you're going to go about it so you can get people to opt in or to opt out and they can say that isn't for me. They can't read your mind as a manager, as a founder, and they're not going to figure out how to do that. So it's hard to mobilize an entire organization, whether it's three people or 3,000, without compelling vision, mission, and passion. And it better be genuine, you know? The thing on the card, uh, what, what are you really about as a company? What's, what matters to the people there? Um, how many of you find yourself in life, you know, focusing on the journey? Uh, how many of us do that? Boy, it's really hard right now. I love this slog, All right? That's yeah, just, you know, it's really tired. You're, you're dragging, you're fighting a cold, you got a lot of work to do, you know, haven't got much money. You're going, I'm, I'm not feeling the love right now for the journey. The point is, though, you're always looking ahead. If you can't find some energy out of the journey, no matter where you are in your life situation, whether you're in school or you're working, and if the journey doesn't, especially when you're, if you get a group of people around you that you love to be on the journey with, if that journey becomes as important, the good days and the bad as, as the destination, you're going to be successful. If you find that your only thing keeping you in there is focusing in the future, whether it's my stock options someday might be worth money, whether it's if I just do this for a couple of years, I'll get a better job. If that's, then it's just the means. And so the point is find a way, even in the hard times, this is not just work, but it's life, to, to say, you know, am I doing what I want to be doing? How can I extract a little bit of joy to the journey, even at the hardest times? And, I, and that's a challenge, and we all go through that. But that's the thing that renews you in spirit. Um, now we get down to the real stuff. Uh, this question earlier about financing. If you don't make money over some period of time, you cease to exist. There are amazingly great companies here in the Valley that, uh, that three or four years ago had great futures. And they're getting crushed in financing. Those are the ones that are getting financed or they're going away. Now, the good news is it's kind of Darwinian. They're, they're, the companies that are getting financed are the best-in-class companies, and, but, but it's a hard thing. So the point is, at some point with any company, you have to not be a nonprofit anymore. So you have to figure out a way to make money or you're going to cease to exist. And even if you're a, a wealthy operating company that's making a lot of money, you're only a few turns around the corner from disaster, a disruptive new entrant, a problem. So you always have to be thinking about what happens if this happens, if growth slows, how will we adjust? Do we have plan A, B, C? So it goes back to if you're not making money, you're not in control of your own life with a company, whether you're an entrepreneur. And if you can't see how you'll finance it, then you've got to figure out how to bootstrap it yourself and make enough to at least uh, cover your costs. Um, Execution is most of the game. Um, I have friends at McKinsey and other great consulting firms, and they're great strategy presentations. At the end of the day, that strategy relies on execution. And, and execution relies on whether it's three of you in a room and you've got a little company, or whether it's 3,000 people, everybody understanding what the play is, knowing what they're supposed to do, and then making that happen again and again and again. And so great companies sometimes don't make it, not because they didn't have great ideas or a compelling strategy and vision. It's because they just couldn't execute and get it done. And if you can build that systematic capability into the company by the way you hire and the systems you build to support that, then it doesn't seem like an everyday thing where you're propping it up. You'll know it's wrong and your execution isn't working when if anybody takes their hand off it, it falls down. So what you want to think about is how do you build a company where, where it just happens because you're doing the right things and you're doing it in concert? And so you're going to get rewarded for finishing stuff in life, whether it's school, whether it's your business, uh, building something. And so the, the strategy is really about the beginning often. The, the execution is about ensuring you can finish that. Make sense? I know it sounds boring. I'm just an operating guy. What do I know? Um, all right. I'm not so boring as you think. Going too fast is far better than going too slow. Um, and so most of the mistakes, when you don't make a decision, guess what? What is that? Mistake. That's making a decision, right? Even, especially if it's hard or it's going to upset somebody or whatever. How many times have you done something and you finally said, boy, I should have done that a long time ago? Is that any of you have that experience? You know it. It just takes time. So in an organization, imagine that you know, kind of magnified by the number of employees you've got. And if you drop in that reflex delay for what everybody knows is the right thing to do, even if it's hard, you just burn time and that's the thing you can't get back. So going too fast creates problems. 
And, but, if, but if you're good about it, you can undo those and adjust. But if you, at least if you're heading the right direction, going fast, making decisions quickly, and then adjusting is usually a far better problem than going too slow and considering it forever. And that leads to the next one, which is procrastination is the mother of all ineptitude. You can always find a reason not to do it now. And a boss of mine a long time ago who was really hard on me, you can tell now I admire him, um, he used to make me do the, the thing I hated the most on my list of to-dos. I'd have a whole list of stuff I had to get done, and he'd say, i got to see that by noon. I'd go, oh, that's, I, I thought I could put that off till next week. And the point was, get after the hardest thing. And you guys have learned this. You're all smart. You're in great school. You've gone, you, you, when you're freshest, you go after your hardest subject, your toughest lab, and you get at it when you're fresh. And even if it's not what you want to do, there's something you have greater interest in, but you know you've got to do that. You've learned by experience. So the point is, if, if you put off this thing that's hard or it's ugly or it isn't defined, it's just going to get worse, and it goes back to the point above that, right? Now you're going slow. Um, this idea about winning and momentum and confidence, uh, it, it, it just, when especially it's you. When you, you start getting successful, somebody's going, wow, that went pretty well. You feel like you can take more risk. You feel like you can move faster. You trust your instincts better. It's, it's like that magnified in a company. Once a team starts to get, uh, once a team starts to have success, it just further primes the pump, and and this idea of momentum and confidence and ability to take risk just gets magnified. And by the way, you can lose that, and then it's a great question: Do we go back to being risk averse, or do we continue to press advantage? And the answer is: All right, what did we learn from that? How do you fix that? What went wrong? What would we have done better? Have an after-action review and say, boy, that that really that may have screwed up, and it may be painful. But what do we take out of that? How do we reapply that quickly? Doesn't mean everything else we did wasn't right. It just means we stubbed our toe on this one. Now go back and, and reapply that. So this idea of, of, and then gaining confidence in yourself and your team to go along. That's a really big deal. When you haven't had that win, now you've got to get a few wins under your belt, and the organization takes off from there. Um, so here we are. The, uh, most of our competitors out there are, are huge companies, and we're competing with divisions of theirs. They have vastly greater resources, huge organizations, they can put almost unlimited capabilities to work against us. So guess what? You saw the slide. We have enormous intellectual property in this area, and we keep inventing new things and extending our intellectual property and imagining how one of you brilliant people would come up with an idea now after I've given you this, this lousy uh, little speech, how you could get out of line technology as a competitor. We, we, and so what I'll call is healthy, if you're paranoid, somebody's behind you, right? You're only paranoid if there really is somebody behind you, uh, I guess is the definition from a psychologist friend of mine. The point is, you always stay humble and hungry and be paranoid that somebody could get at your business. And if you do that, and you always imagine, whether it's a big company or a startup, what would they have to invent to turn us upside down? What would a big company have to do to upset our business model and, and do better than we can? What if somebody could satisfy the customer dramatically better at a better value proposition than we could? And so you maintain that healthy paranoia, and that helps keep you humble, humble and hungry. And again, if, if your goal is not only to innovate, but to capture a lot of the advantage in the space, then, then it kind of takes naturally. And then, you know, this last question about culture when we were talking over here, any leader, whether you're the, the, a manager of a small department or a, a group of three and you're the CEO, you're, you cast a shadow, and, and those are good habits and personal styles as well as bad. And you usually have blind spots. So have the presence of mind to understand that you know, how you're being perceived isn't necessarily how you believe you're being perceived, and to recognize that the great things about you are, are also there are things that aren't great about you that either rub other people or create challenges or some people don't understand you. So I'd say be open to 360, accept that's part of your opportunity for growth, and recognize that, uh, that any, any leader casts a shadow, good and bad. Um, and it's, we're all humans, and none of us are perfect. Um, any thoughts, questions about this? Uh, yes? Is your IP council in-house or outsourced, and why? Uh, the question is, is our IP council in-house or outsourced, and uh, uh, one of the things that the answer is in we have a pretty significant IP staff for a company of our side and we use a lot of external litigators we've been in lots of IP tussles we've never lost an IP battle about our IP and we've, we've protected it and defended it and extended it very well but one of the things the company did very very well I, I give them enormous credit they recognized how novel this was 
and along with the financing sources, the VC said, let's invest real resources into, into writing quality disclosures and thinking how we'd practice this art and creating a very good patent estate. We have an amazing patent estate. So uh, that's important to us. We spend real resources on it. It's, most of that's inside. Other questions? Almost running to the end of your attention span and, and forbearance. Um, let me just quickly, we, we talked about a couple of things when, we were, uh, when you were asking questions about health care and opportunity. I'm going to say that one of my concerns is this regulatory environment. This is set up as a build. It shouldn't be. I'm going to put them all up here, and we can just touch on them. Thank you. All right. So we talked about this. The, there, there is a sea change going on from a policy perspective as we're trying to figure out the new health care system, if it is yet a system indeed. And that means regulators and policymakers and others are all in motion. For, for a young company trying to get funding and for existing companies trying to bring new products and innovation, that's paralyzing. Um, the problem is, on the bottom, everybody's becoming more risk-averse. And I was railing against a friend of mine who runs a lot, a lot of life science uh, venture deals. And they said, we're, we believe in some of these young companies. If we fund a big A round right now about something we really believe in, when it comes to the B round, we're going to get crushed anyways. And our whole investment will be wiped out. So we're just waiting for somebody else to do that. And then we'll do the B round and crush them. Now, you know what? That means the company never gets off the ground because everybody's waiting for that. The second thing is nobody wants to take any risk. And so everybody's pulling back. That's everybody in the system. At the end of the day, what this means is I think we're going to have a very big problem. The next five to seven years, we're going to have a, a bit of a gap in technology and innovation flow that's going to propagate through the system. My hope is this all settles down. The rules kind of get established and promulgated, and we all adjust, and we continue to, continue to move biotech and med tech forward. Um, with that, I'll just basically say uh, I, to the question up here by the young lady, there are still incredible opportunities in life sciences, in med tech and biotech, and, uh, and there is so much need. I saw a statistic that only 8% of the world's population even has basic access to a doctor, only 8%. So imagine what's possible for us to think about helping, helping the rest of the population. You know, you've got some big trends, urbanization, affluence increasing, and, and, you know, disease states going from acute to chronic. Imagine the scale for the world over the next 50 years of what that translates to. So there will be, these are enormous societal problems. There will be opportunities to make huge impact in people's lives and to build great companies. And so with that, I'll stop. I think I'm out of time, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much.